work.
I learned when teaching school, when everybody got quiet, it's time to start. So I guess that uh, makes it time for us to begin. We got two or three minutes or three seconds here. We'll uh, be on the radio and live stream in a few minutes, I'm sure. Uh, just a couple of updates from things this morning. Um, I mentioned about uh, ages two or ages uh, 12 through high school, seventh grade through high school, uh, going to a program called Horizons at Freed Hardeman. Uh, it's available to you. It's, it's from Monday through Friday. Uh, you stay in the dorm rooms, you have counselors, you go to meetings, uh, spiritual, spiritual activities, uh, physical activities, all kinds of fun, and, and you get to spend some time on the Freed Hardeman campus learn what college life would be like. It's a Christian college. We would encourage everyone to have that uh, would like to go, we'd encourage you to go. I also said that uh, it's July 2 through 7, July 2nd through 7th, if anyone's interested in thinking about doing this, and we would encourage you to think about it. The elders have uh, decided that uh, we would scholarship one half of the cost. The cost of this per week uh, for each camper is $200, and that includes meals, everything, except maybe some souvenirs or snacks that you might buy. Then um, we have, we want you to, the young people, to think about attending this. We have decided that we would pay half of that so that it would help to encourage our young folks to go. Through the generosity of some in this congregation, it has also been uh, extended to us that if anyone has any problem with that under, other hundred dollars keeping you from going, that will also be scholarship. So there's absolutely no reason that every young person in this congregation from age 12 through high school or it may be juniors in high school, I'm not sure. Or, no, it'd be seniors. Junior, okay. Seniors, yeah, all right. Age uh, 12 through seniors in high school, there's no reason that you can't attend that program if you'd like to. We have it covered for you if you need the extra money. So do not let money stand in the way of your participation in this program. We urge you to think about that, consider it, and we would like to see every one of our young people uh, participate in this wonderful program at Free Armand University in July. So young people be thinking about it. I'm sure we'll be talking more about it, and Travis will be giving more information as we go along. Okay, uh, the other, uh, one other thing I'd like to mention is that next Sunday will be a little bit different. We have... Uh, told the congregation that uh, one of the things that we want to concentrate on this this year uh, in addition to youth and missions is evangelism. And next Sunday, uh, Bob York will be presenting a lesson on evangelism, encouraging us, trying to give us some instructions on how to evangelize. And the order of services will be considerably different. Um, so we're probably going to have announcements first and then we're going to do the uh, things that Bob wants to do on evangelism. So uh, the thing I'm just simply telling you now is that be ready that next Sunday will be organized slightly different from what it normally is. So uh, we hope that next Sunday will be very encouraging to this congregation and will set us on the right path to go out and meet people and evangelize in this world today. It is very difficult to evangelize today, and we know that. And Bob is deeply, deeply involved and in wanting to get this congregation more involved in evangelism than we have in the past, and we're going to concentrate on that next Sunday. So make a special effort to be here next Sunday, and we will talk about evangelism. The other announcement I have is that Van Wood is sick and has asked for our prayers. Uh, we obviously always have a, a prayer for those who are sick and who are, need our prayers. And at this time, if you would, uh, bow with me and we'll have a prayer for Van. 
Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we know that you answer our prayers. We know that when we petition you before your throne, that you look down upon us and you hear our prayers. And Father, at this time for Van Wood, we are praying. Father, for the physical problems that he is having and the suffering that he is having, we ask that you would look down upon him, that you would consider that, and that you would help him to find ways to alleviate these problems. We ask that you bless him, Father. These things we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. Jeff Jones has one other announcement, and then we, Tyler, are you leading the singing? Okay. Just one quick note. We need a uh, kindergarten Sunday morning school teacher starting in March. I think that'd be next Sunday. So unlike the Horizons uh, program, this is a fully funded program. You will be paid at full rate. So uh, anyone that's interested in that kindergarten position starting next Sunday, just see me at this time, okay? Thank you. Standing on the promises. Let's stand as we stand on the promises and sing this song. 452, standing on the promises. <clears throat> standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternal bond and love strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. You may be seated. Our song before Jared has our opening prayer will be 496, 496, so listen to the wondrous story. <clears throat> oh, listen to our wondrous story, counted once among the lost. Yet yeah, one came down from heaven's glory, saving us at awful cost. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Where is he now? In heaven interceding. No angel could his place have taken. Highest of the high though he. The loved one on the cross forsaken Was one of the Godhead three Who 
saved us from eternal loss. What did he do? Where is he now? In heaven interceding. Will you surrender to this Savior, to his scepter humbly bow? You too shall come to know his favor. He will save you, save you now. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Where is he now? In heaven interceding. Bow with me. Father, we thank you for the blessings of the day and the opportunity to worship you. We pray, Lord, that as a church body coming together that we've been pleasing to you. And we pray that tonight we can continue that worship. Lord, we have several in mind that we want to bring before you. Those who have lost loved ones and uh, those requesting prayers. We especially want to think about the Bean family and uh, Van Wood. And we ask that your blessings be on them and others who have uh, lost loved ones and who are in need with uh, health. And, and issues. Father, we especially want to uh, pray that you'll be with us spiritually as a uh, body outreaching into this community and also as individuals who are seeking to do your will. Help us to do what's right and help us to grow closer to you. In your son's name, amen. If you would be standing for our next song, those that are participating in children's class can be dismissed to that as we sing this song, 76. How great thou art. And uh, after we sing this song, if you would please remain standing respectfully as we have a reading from Scripture. 76. <clears throat> o Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then 
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Scripture reading this evening will be from Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You may be seated. Good evening. I am making a lot of friends with the uh, scripture readings through our Beatitudes. So that's a good thing. One of the things Kevin told me earlier was every time I've had him read scripture, it's always had the about three or four different cities and about three or four different of those five syllable names. So I told him if I knew he was the one reading, I would have changed it. But I didn't find out to the very end. Glad that you're here. Glad we have an opportunity to be together. Glad a lot of our folks from CYC are back with us once again. It's good to see you. And uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to preach. Uh, at the beginning of this week, I thought, man, I got this week off. There's all sorts of things I can do. I think I even took Bob with me. We went visiting Monday or Tuesday or something. And then we realized the CYC folks would be gone. And so he called me and said, hey, you need to preach Sunday. And I thought, oh, no, I actually got to work the rest of the week terrible stuff, but uh, I enjoy the honor of being up here. It's a lot of fun being a preacher, and especially it's fun being the preacher here. What I want us to talk about tonight is, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. As you've looked at the Beatitudes going through it, you notice that there's eight. They're in the chiastic uh, uh, formula, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to the end, and we talk about how all these things work together. But what you'll notice as you look through it, you see the first four talk about how to become a Christian. Talk about what you need to do in order to be right with God. It talks about this idea of humbling yourself. It talks about the idea of repentance or keeping yourself under control. It talks about this idea of seeking after God or showing faith and things such as that. And so as you go through those first four, you see this prospect of what it means to become a Christian what it means to work on our journey towards God. Now on the back side of it, we start seeing what Christians are to do. And this is the first of the uh, things which Christians are told to do. If you are to be a Christian, Jesus says, you must be a person who shows mercy. You are to be a person who shows mercy to other people. So the question is, first of all, what in the world is mercy? When we talk about mercy, exactly what do we mean by it in the Bible? What are we looking at? mercy is difficult to define because it is so similar to grace. As you and I think about this idea of grace, grace is um, unmerited favor, right? And you've heard a lot of those sermons about grace. You use the letters G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. In other words, Christ died for us even while we were yet sinners. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves, lest any person should boast. And so grace is this idea, when we look at it, of God being kind to us even when we don't deserve it. Of us just being a random person who has not done anything to deserve salvation. A person who uh, has no, no inherent value, at least in this aspect, of God's love, and yet that person receives it. That's what grace is. Now, mercy is a negative side of that. And it's a very uh, small distinction, and so a lot of times we get confused. Grace is God's giving us something that we don't deserve. Mercy is God relenting from giving us what we deserve. Remember, the soul who sins, that soul shall die, right? Ezekiel 18, 20. For the wages of sin is death, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. You and I, if we have reached the age of accountability, and just about everybody in here has, we deserve to die. We deserve to be punished. We deserve to be judged. But God has withheld that wrath that you and I have earned. He does not give us what we've earned. 
because of his great love for us. Now, there's an illustration. Uh, you may have heard of him, maybe not. He was a classic uh, debater in the early part of last century, 1920s, 1930s, around that area. And oftentimes he would debate Christians. And one thing Robert Ingersoll would oftentimes do is during one of the periods which he was to debate, he'd have about 10 minutes or so. He'd talk about five minutes. And then near the end of that last five minutes, he'd hold up his watch. And he'd say, I have this watch set at five minutes till 12. And so what needs to happen is, is there a God? And if there is a God, he would say, I request that God to strike me dead with lightning. And he said, and so if there's a God, he can prove to every one of you that he exists here. And I'm going to set this watch right here. And we'll wait five minutes. And then he would just stare down the audience and intimidate them. Oftentimes, he would see that as a way to win whatever debate he was in. Well, there was one time he did that in the debate. And the other man stood up when the time was done and the five minutes had passed. And he said, not only does that prove the existence of God, it shows God's mercy. Because Robert did not get exactly what he deserved. Imagine... If you and I, in our life, got everything we deserved, how much trouble would we be in? Well, you and I may say, well, hey, where I work, I deserve more money. Or man, as many good things as I've done, I deserve to have an easier life. Or I deserve it to be better one way or the other. But that's looking at our life from a skewed perspective. Imagine if your spouse only loved you when you deserved it. Imagine if your parents only loved you when you deserved it. Imagine if God only loved you when you deserved it. You see there the importance of mercy. You see there also the importance of grace. Mercy is looking at the power and the strength of God in God's righteousness and God's judgment. And as you and I look at that, we see where, uh, we see where Jesus, as he hangs on the cross, and as he's put to death... We see where he cries out near the end of it, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Imagine what we deserve today, because you're in my sins, put Jesus on that cross. But his mercy gives us an opportunity to repent of that sin. His mercy gives us an opportunity to once again live right. Well, we see what mercy is. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. But go a little deeper. What does the Bible teach about mercy? First of all, the Bible's teaching on mercy is it tells us about the character and the nature of God. First Chronicles 16, verse 34, as the, uh, as the uh, temple is starting to be dedicated to prayer there, says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord God, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. As you and I look there in uh, the New Testament, Let's see, it is in the Minor Prophet book of Joel chapter 2 and verse 13, classic passage, the one that we memorize usually out of Joel, right? If, unless you're going to into the Acts 2 quotation. Joel 2 verse 13, rend not your heart or rend not your garments. Instead, break your heart because our God is merciful and our God will show his loving kindness towards you. Looking at those two verses, what we see there is the nature of our God. And how is it that you view God? Some people look at God and they think of him as an old man who can't really pay attention. Almost like some people in the sermon. They just fall asleep, right? I say that early because I don't see anybody asleep yet. But sometimes we view God as, man, he's asleep. He's up there far away. And so I can sin and I can do whatever I want to do. And at the very last part, then I'm going to repent. Then I'm going to be okay. And at the very last part, I'm going to get away with whatever it may be. Other people see God as someone who's very cruel and angry. And he's just sitting there with his lightning bolt or whatever else it is he's going to get us with. And he's watching for you and I just to make a mistake. And as soon as we make a mistake, he's going to whack us like you would whack a fly. Well, what is the character and nature of God? Looking at these two passages, we see that there's a God who must judge us because he's righteous and holy. But a God who's looking for an opportunity to give us a chance. Remember how Peter puts it in his letter? He said, you know, some people mock God and say he's never coming. He doesn't exist. Every day is the same as it's always been. He said, but consider the Lord. He's not slack. He's not lazy as some people consider being lazy. But he's long-suffering, not willing that anyone, not willing that anyone should perish. And so mercy shows us God's character. It shows us his nature that's there. It's two sides of the coin. There's justice, but there's also mercy. 
But we go a little bit deeper and we see that mercy enables God to be sensitive to your and my distress. Psalm chapter 4 and verse 1, To God for my righteousness, you have given me great mercy. You see, think about how amazing it is that our God loves us. Here's the one who created the world in six days. Here's the one who can do absolutely anything and everything. Here's the one that on the final day shall judge us and stand before every person. And every person, whether they're great or they're small, no matter when they lived, shall answer before God. And yet, that great one knows the numbers of hair on my head and your head. That great one knows the concerns and the issues that are going on in your heart. And he wants you to be saved. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to have a life that prospers in a spiritual way. And so our God, my God, is sensitive to distress. And as we cry out to God about the issues we have in life and about the hurts that we have in life, God cares. And he understands exactly what it is that we're going through. Number three, mercy, as we read about it in the Bible, deters the punishment that we deserve for sin. Mercy is what gives us hope. In Psalm 51, verse 1, that great psalm which we all know of in Scripture so well, it's when David was confronted by Nathan the prophet about his sin before Bathsheba. And David begins to repent, and so he writes this poem, he writes this psalm, and as he opens up on it, he says, Have mercy on me, O God. Show me the great mercy which you have and blot out my transgressions. What did David deserve for what he had done? He had committed adultery. He had lied. He had murdered. And he had hidden all these things. And as a leader of God's people, he had led the people astray. And he had caused a curse to come upon the entire nation. What did he deserve? We know he deserved death. We know he deserved punishment. We know that he deserved the same thing his predecessor had. Remember King Saul, for sins that seemed to be much less to you and I, he lost the very spirit of God and the spirit of the devil entered into him. But David relied upon God's mercy and he prayed to him. And as he prayed to him, that sin was deterred and pushed away. Now, go over to the New Testament. Luke chapter 18 and verse 13. Here we see, and I oftentimes make fun of it, it's the a prayer meeting in the temple, right? And here's this Pharisee who says, God, you're lucky to have me. I tithe and I uh, you know, fast two times a week. I am the super Christian. I'm the best one that's around here. Remember what the tax collector, the sinner prayed? Very simple prayer. But there's a special word in that prayer. What's that prayer? He beat his chest. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me, for I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, a man who prays that prayer, that man is the one who left justified before God. He's the one who left and that God loved and that God respected. Now, put that in your mind and put that in your life as we are here having church services. As God has watched us, perhaps he's impressed by the way in which we've sung the songs on key and perhaps the way in which the songs have sounded because we have a lot of people here with beautiful voices. And some of us sing also. You know, you got your soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, and some people sing also, right? Maybe he's loved these beautiful prayers and this great scripture reading which we've had. Maybe he's endured the sermon. Maybe he's even enjoyed the sermon. What is it that God loves about it when God's people get together to worship? He loves the mercy. He loves that attitude in which we rely upon God in which we look forward to him. Is God more glorified in a 500-member church, in a 300-member church, in a church of 10 people? He's glorified when his people get together and they pray for mercy and they pray for God's love to each and every one of them. And lastly, looking at this point, the Bible's teaching on mercy is this. Mercy is the answer to man's hopelessness. We live in a world where people have no hope. And oftentimes we look, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, remember that passage? Now these three things abide, faith, love, and hope. The greatest of these is love. You hear a lot of sermons on love, right? You hear a lot of sermons on faith. Don't hear a lot of sermons on hope. And we need to have more sermons on hope. Preacher saying that's kind of funny, isn't it? 
But we need to have sermons focusing there, Romans 15, 13, talking about the God of all hope who keeps us in everything that we do. Because there's a lot of people who look at their lives and they look at the situation they're in and say, there's no hope. I can't change. I can't be what I need to be. There's a lot of people who, even though they're trying to be good, have not found the light and they say, there's just no hope. There's a lot of people, even in the church, that cannot be sure about their salvation because they don't have the faith yet in God that God will keep his promises. The answer for hopelessness in man is the doctrine and the concept of mercy. Psalm 56, verse 1, Be gracious to me, O God, and always show your mercy upon me. Going back to the New Testament, Hebrews 4, 16, Let us draw near to those who are full of grace, that we might find mercy and help in our time of need. Well, what are some examples of mercy? Look at some of these guys in the Bible, okay? First and foremost, <coughs> we'll go through these in more or less order. I've written down six of them as I was putting this lesson together. Uh, Genesis 19, verse 16, you see Lot. Lot and his two daughters. Here's a man who needed mercy. Here's a man who, uh, when he was confronted by Abraham because their men were fighting, he had to make a choice. Where are you going to go? Do you you got to separate from Abraham, so if you have an opportunity to separate, where are you going to go? Lot looked around, and he focused on where the greener grass was, and on where the more of the money was, and upon where the more of the prestige was, Right? He pitched his tent, the Bible says, towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, quick lesson there. When you make decisions in life, what do you base those decisions on? Lot could have looked over more towards God's country and made a decision to go there and stayed away from those godless people. But that wasn't his decision. His decision was to go where the money was, where the people were, where the prestige was. Wow, look at us today. When you have to make a decision in life, where do you make your decision? Do you pitch your tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah, where there's more money, where there's more people, and where there's more prestige, or do you always focus on Abraham? Wow, I'm going to make that a sermon someday. That might work. But going back to this lesson, you see Lot goes into Sodom, and as he's there, you know what happens. Those angels come in to warn him. All these terrible things will occur between the daughters and everything else, and it's just you see the situation that Lot's in. And Lot is in a fix. He, because of his decisions, has put his family in danger. He, because of his decisions, is going to have to leave some of his family behind. Now, my reading of this passage is different than most people's reading of this passage. So, when you have opportunity, read Genesis 19 and show me where I'm wrong, okay? Because I may be wrong. Don't often hear preachers say that, do you? You've got Lot who flees the city with two virgin daughters, okay? But while you're in the city, you'll notice that Lot talks to two of his son-in-laws. Perhaps there's some sort of marriage cultural situation going on here, but it looks to me like when Lot and his wife left, not only did he leave with his two daughters, but he had to leave some of his family behind, at least his son-in-laws and perhaps even his daughters. And I think that may show us a reason why Lot's wife so badly wanted to look back and go back. Why were they in that situation? Because of bad decisions that were made. But even though those bad decisions were made, we read there in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 16 that God still showed them mercy. And he would, as Jude says, snatch them from the fire and bring them out. Did Lot deserve it? Not a bit, but God loved Abraham, and therefore God loved Lot, and he saved Lot and his daughters. Going a little bit later in the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 39 and verse 21, we see a man named Joseph. And we spoke about Joseph a little bit this morning. Here's a man who had many reasons to turn away from God, family problems. The brothers sold him into slavery, trying to make sure that he would die. Uh, problems with your friends. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and when it didn't work, she lied about him and caused him to be thrown into prison. He gets into prison, he's still trying to be faithful to God, and what happens? Even though he's helped people through the uh, miraculous works which God has given him, they forget about him. 
But Joseph is always faithful. And Joseph rises to be second in command of all of Egypt. Now many years later, many years later, here's Joseph. Standing up, looking like Pharaoh, looking like a foreigner, dressed in Egyptian clothes. And he looks out and here comes some men from Judea. And these men look familiar. They're his brothers. Joseph wouldn't have been in prison if it wasn't for these men. Joseph wouldn't have been accused by Potiphar if it wasn't for these men. Joseph wouldn't have spent much of his life as a slave if it wasn't for these men. Joseph's father would not have been heartbroken his entire life because of these men. What would you do? If somebody had destroyed your life, what would you do with them? Joseph said, I don't condemn you. God meant this for a greater purpose. Therefore, Joseph showed to him mercy. Go a little bit later in our scriptures and we go all the way to the New Testament because I only have so much time. Matthew chapter 9, looking there in verse 27, you see the two blind men and they're without hope. Jesus looked upon them and guess what? Upon them he had mercy. Matthew 15, verse 22, there's a young boy who is possessed by a demon. And his parents are distraught, especially his father, because every time there's a fire, this boy wants to go and run into the fire. And so you can imagine how disfigured this boy is. He's possessed by a demon. Jesus has mercy upon the father and upon him. And he heals this boy. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 15, you see there's a boy with epilepsy. Once again, Jesus has mercy upon this man. And he heals that boy. Each time when you see these wonderful miracles happening, you see that our God, our Son of God here, is a God of mercy. Now, ooh, application here. In Luke 10, 36 through 37, somebody comes up to Jesus and they say, Okay, Jesus, who is my neighbor? If you say, I've got to love God and I've got to love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? What Jesus says, you know, there's one day a man was going down the road to Jericho and he fell aside and was waylaid by robbers. The priest comes by, looks at him, and the priest has to go on his way. The Levite comes by, looks at him, and the Levite goes on his way. But then a Samaritan comes by. A half-breed, a person who does not believe in the same God, does not worship in the correct way, a person who, if he touches you, you become unclean. A person who probably should not have even been on that road. Who would not have been allowed on that road. And this Samaritan stops and picks him up. He cleans his wounds. He takes him to the hospital, or to the inn. And he says, now notice this, okay? This is a big deal, right? If you've ever had medical deals, bills, this is a big deal. He says, here is the money to pay the doctors, and if he needs any more, I will make it so. That's a big deal right there, paying somebody's medical bills. And Jesus looked at the man, and he said, okay, who was neighborly towards this man? That hurt, because he had to say the Samaritan. Now, why was he neighborly? Because he had mercy. Did this man sitting on the side of the road deserve to be helped by the Samaritan? No. Was the man sitting on the side of the road convenient to be helped by the Samaritan? No. But the Samaritan loved him enough to help him. That brings us to our application. Jesus wants you and I to practice mercy on other people. And so I want to look at this in four different ways. What is mercy? What is mercy? It's the compassion that you feel for other people. Do you love other people? Now, that sounds like a silly question. Because a lot of us say, well, yeah, I love people in my family. I love people at work. I love Kentucky basketball. If they would ever start winning again. <laughs> That's not the question, though. Do you love people? There are a lot of people who care only for themselves. There's a lot of people who are wrapped up only in their life. And they're only going to care about you in the way in which you can help them and in the way in which you can give them value to their life. It's not what Jesus has called us to do. He's called us to love people. 
We just looked at a few examples very quickly by design because I want to go back to some of them. The epileptic, the demon-possessed, the widow of Nain who just lost her boy. Jesus saw each one of these situations and he took opportunity to make their lives better. Even though they could never return anything, our God shows mercy and he has called for us to show mercy as well. God, Jesus, wants us to practice mercy. Have you, in this last week, responded to someone's cry for help? Have you, in this last week, responded to somebody's need? I'm amazed in our congregation of all the people who help one another. There's a lot of people in here who drive people to doctors. There's a lot of people in here who take advantage and take opportunity whenever they can help someone. There's a lot of people in here who will leave a note to one or another saying, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. I support you. I want what's good for you. And that's what makes this congregation be so wonderful, is the love and the mercy that exist here. Now, here's your homework. Now, I'm not going to grade your papers because I don't want to fail you. I don't want to fail you out of Benton and make you go somewhere else. But here's your homework. This next week, show mercy to other people. Look for someone who's disadvantaged and show them mercy. Think about someone who's lonely. Think about someone who's hurting. And make an email, make a card, make a call. Think about somebody who needs something. And find a way in your life that you can bless them. You see, Jesus has called us to practice mercy. Here's the third way. And this is a scary one. How do you show mercy? By the lack of harshness which you judge others. You ever find in your life, maybe I find sometimes in my life, where we make a decision of who's going to heaven and who's going to hell? Ah, that's not my job. My job and your job is to preach the gospel. To show people the direction to go. I'm not God, and you're not God. And we've got to be very careful before we judge other people. I think it was Jesus. Yeah, it was. Who said, in the way in which you judge others, you yourself shall also be judged. We've got to be very careful before we start categorizing people. And don't look at them as personalities, but look at them as just chess pieces on the board. We have to be very careful in the way in which we show judgment to other people. Number four is closely related to that. How do we practice mercy? We practice it in the way that we stand for the truth without destroying people. Now think about that for a little bit. You can stand for truth without destroying people. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 talks about how you must always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. And oftentimes we'll quote that. Man, we're good with that. We can quote a verse about why you need to be baptized, a verse or two about why we take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, a verse or two of why we sing a cappella, which is Latin for other church. And we can answer these questions. But look at the end of 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. And what does it say? Be always ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you and do so in a spirit of meekness and gentleness. Parallel words to that idea of mercy. Now, that does not mean that we have to water down the truth. And that does not mean that some days we're not going to be somewhat similar to Jesus in trying to cleanse the temple of ungodliness. There are some times where we have to get angry and where we should get angry and when we sin by not being more angry upon people trampling underfoot the doctrine of God. But for the most part, we need to be a people who extend mercy. We need to be a people who extend love and understanding one to another. To close, let's look over Matthew chapter 18. And as we look at Matthew 18, we'll focus on verse 33, and we see that Jesus tells a parable. Peter comes up to him and he says, Lord, you know, how many times should I forgive? These Pharisees say you forgive three times. I'm a good follower of Christ because I'm an apostle. I forgive seven times. And Jesus says, listen, if you're really going to follow God, 
if you're really going to be a person of mercy, you need to forgive 70 times 7. 490 times for those who like to do math in church. That's a lot. And Jesus said, let me tell you a story. There was a man who went out one day, and he owed money to a king. And he owed that king 10,000 talents. And he stood before that king, and he said, I can never pay. And the king said, well, you and your wife and your children are going to be sold into slavery, and everything you own will be sold, and we'll just call it even after that. And the man fell to his knees and said, Lord, please have mercy on me. I can never repay that. And so the king had mercy and let him go. Well, as this man was out about in his daily life, he ran across a fellow, and this fellow owed him some money, 100 denarii, and he began to shake him, and he said, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to make sure I get every penny back that, I, that I'm owed. And he did not show mercy at all. The king heard about it and called his servant in, the first servant again. And he said, listen, if you're not going to show mercy, mercy will not be shown to you. Now, we more or less get the point of this parable, but let's look a little closer and put it in today's terms. A talent is going to be a year's wage, okay? And so imagine what you make in a year and multiply that times 10,000. That's probably a lot. Once again, here we are in church doing math. Man, that's bad. But probably you are somewhere in the range of half a million dollars. If somebody told you right now, hand over half a million dollars or else, the vast majority of us are going to be in a little bit of trouble, right? It's going to be kind of rough. Well, sometimes when we say this parable, we go over and say, hey, listen, this other guy, he didn't do anything, are they? He didn't owe anything. Well, he owed a little bit. In fact, he owed quite a bit. A denarii is a day's wage. And so you look at today's and a day's wage, you, you, let's say you, it's $80 that you would make in a day. Minimum wage or so, a long day there. Multiply that 80 times 100, it's 8,000. Once again, there's not many of us who could fork over $8,000 and still be in a good mood. It's a pretty substantial thing that is owed here. And so what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, when people have wronged you, you need to show them mercy. Because that is a reflection of what God has done for you. And Jesus is saying, in many ways, your Christian walk is that idea of showing mercy to those who have done wrong to you. Now, that does not excuse the sins of other people. And it does not make it where you need to overlook it when somebody wrongs you and they have not made it right. But that does mean that you have to hand it over to God. And you have to let God fix those problems. And you have to let God take care of those problems. It's not my job to put anybody in heaven nor put anybody in hell. But it's my job to show mercy as a reflection to the mercy that God has given to me. So let's review very quickly and then we'll be done. Mercy is different than grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Mercy is a lack of condemnation, even though I deserve it. And as you and I run through the scriptures, we see that mercy defines God's interaction with man. So often we deserve to be judged, but God has delayed it, and God has forgiven it because of his love for us when we're obedient. We see many examples throughout scripture of where Jesus, looking upon people who are in terrible situations, has shown mercy. And then we bring it to us, and we see, according to the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, that one of the foundational aspects of yours and my Christian life is that we show mercy to people who don't deserve it. And we show mercy to the world, because that's what makes us look like Jesus. And so remember your homework for this week. Show mercy and kindness to the world and to one another. This evening, if the invitation applies to you, if you want to obey the gospel and become a Christian, or if you need to pray to the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing. Jesus knows when I am lonely. He knows each pain. He sees each tear. He 
understands each lonely heartache. He understands because he cares. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. My Jesus knows when I am burdened. He knows how much my heart can bear. He lifts me up when I am sinking and brings me joy beyond compare. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. When other friends seem to forget me when skies are dark my hope is gone by faith i feel his arms about me and hear him say you're not alone my jesus knows just what i need Yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. You may be seated. If you have yet to have opportunity to observe the Lord's Supper today, we have that prepared for you in the library out the back of the auditorium. As we sing number 221, you can be dismissed to take the Lord's Supper if that applies to you. 221, we'll sing this through twice and then have our closing prayer. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Dear Heavenly Father, we can come to you. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us to be here tonight. We thank you for this good lesson we've heard tonight. We pray that you'll help us, each one of us to be more merciful. We thank you for this country we live in. We pray that you'll be with the leaders of this country so that we can be on the right path. We pray for those who have been mentioned sick, physically and spiritually, that you can be with them and their particular needs and strengthen them. They can be back and well once again. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, that you'll give them the comfort that you can only give in this situation. As we're closing tonight, we pray that you'll be with each one of us, that, that we've been encouraged tonight and be encouraged this day, and we've encouraged others. We pray that we'll be strengthened through 
today and we can be the Christian examples as we're about to leave here and, and go out to the world that we should be. We ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Be standing for our closing song this evening, 736, 736. If you're visiting with us this evening, I want you to know that you are our honored guest, and we really are tickled that you're here, and we want you to come back every chance you can get and be with us. And to Christ be true, 736. To Christ be loyal and be true, his banner be unfurled. And born aloft till is secured the conquest of the world. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you and help you. All your conflicts through to Christ the Lord be true, to Christ be loyal and be true. He needs brave volunteers to stand against the powers of sin, move not by frowns or fears. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you and help you all your conflicts through. To Christ the Lord be true, to Christ be loyal and be true in noble service prove your faith and your fidelity the fervor of your love to Christ the Lord be true for he will go with you and help you Christ the Lord be true. We're dismissed.